welcome to the Mavens of Marketing, a weekly podcast hosted by me, Rachel Durkin. And me, Carrie Barrett. We talk all things marketing, innovation, sales, and business growth strategies, and the standard tried and true marketing techniques. Come for the conversation, stay for the savvy insights. And the borderline inappropriate jokes. Welcome to the Mavens of Marketing. I'm one part of your lovely and talented co-hosting duo, Carrie Barrett, along with the also lovely and talented Rachel Durkin. How are you? I am good. For all of those of you who are listening in, it's four o'clock Eastern time, which means the kids just got off the bus, which means anything can happen. (laughs) Are you ready for Valentine? Is that Valentine's? Is that a dark heart? Yeah. Like it matches my soul. It matches my black soul. You are not the first person to make that joke to me, by the way. I, know. I realized as I was saying it, that it's probably come, you've heard it a time or two. I have. Everybody who knows me keeps bringing it up and be like, oh, I'm so sorry that people are saying that to you. I'm like, you, they, you don't know it at all. <laughs> you know who does not have a black soul? Our fabulous guest today, Julie Broad. How are you? <laughs> Bright and shiny, not black. <laughs> That's what we like to hear. And you've been able some to balance in our lives. <laughs> yeah. She's been able to roll with the chaos that this podcast has been. Listen, for those of you who are watching on YouTube, you may have already seen some bloopers. For those of you who are listening, well, you are lost. But Julie, <laughs> tell us a little bit about your business, what you do, who you are, how you do it. I know that's a really broad question, but we'll dial down into the specifics after you give us all that good stuff. Yeah, for sure. So my company is Book Launchers and we're a professional self-publishing services firm, which means we do everything that you need to have done to bring a book to life and then find readers or just get it into the hands of people that you want to reach with your book because it's not always about readers when it comes to nonfiction book marketing. Sometimes it's about opening the doors and building your brand and really getting your name out there, which a book is a fabulous tool to do it. Um, but my background's not in publishing, not in books. So people always uh, like to learn about that part of it because I am actually a real estate investor since 2001. And uh, my first book was a real estate investing book, which oh. is how I transitioned into the whole book publishing world. I was rejected by Wiley and uh, after they pursued me and then they ended up rejecting me, it was really quite cruel, but <laughs> it's a That's story. Right. That's rude, frankly. It, it, it was, it, it made me cry, but I got <laughs> over it. And, uh, and then I ended up publishing a book that they didn't think was going to sell by someone they didn't think could sell books. And I took it to number one on Amazon and print books. So uh, I was in the top 100 books on Amazon for 45 days. And it was a niche nonfiction self-published real estate investing book. And it turns out books are way more fun than tenants and toilets. So uh, I, little <laughs> bit by bit, I transitioned into, you know, the, what I think is the greatest business in the wide world, helping people bring their messages, their stories, their expertise to the world um, to grow their business and have an impact. So I, I know Rachel has a question, but I do have to ask you, is books are better than tenants or toilets, like sort of your tagline? It should be if it's not. <laughs> It's, it's not. Our tagline is uh, hashtag no boring books. Um, but <laughs> I like I it. it. So let, let's let's start at the beginning. Uh, I'm going to assume that with nonfiction, most of your writers are in the professional service market or they have something of intelligence to share right, with the world. And I work with a lot of clients who leverage books and courses and other things that allow them to raise their visibility and increase their authority in their industry. So here's my question. When somebody's writing a book, what should their expectations be? So should their goals be that they're going to be the number one on Amazon and sell a bazillion copies and be rich that way? Or should it be that they're going to be able to leverage this content to grow their business or both? And then I'll have follow-up questions after that. (laughs) Yeah. And I mean, a lot of this comes down to what you have to begin with. Like what is your current resource level? And then you can determine your expectations from that. But it's a great, it's a smart question because a lot of people come in thinking it's going to do all the things. And as you guys know, uh, in marketing, you're not going to do all the things with one approach. You really have to hone in on one kind of target goal and build a plan to achieve that goal. So if you have multiple goals, you're going to have to have multiple plans to get there, but resources, the real, <laughs> resources exactly. And when I say resources, yes, I'm talking money to a point, but I'm also talking author platform So the people that generally have large launches have a strong platform. 
And that's what traditional book publishers are looking at. They're looking at your platform. How many people do you already have within your reach? Because they can extrapolate from that how many books they think you're going to sell. So from your own perspective, if you have 100 people on an email list, like you really shouldn't expect to be selling thousands and thousands of copies out of the gate. Your book is going to be the tool that you use to grow that audience and to grow that perspective. So it's, it's money, but it's audience. And my book went to number one. I had 10,000 email subscribers, and this was in 2013 when, you know, 40 to 60% open rates were the norm. Um, and so- Ah, uh, the good old days. Right? <laughs> the good old, and when we actually could track open rates, but that's a different story too. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so, but it wasn't that that took my book to number one. It was my network. I had a lot of people in my network, um, realtors and mortgage brokers and, and uh, a magazine, in fact, that I had built relationships with that promoted my book. And that's what drove my book to number one, which was the overall platform. So that's what I mean by resources. It is money, but it's also the people you know, the people in your network as well. How can you leverage a book to grow your business? Let's say your goal is not quantity sales. How do you leverage it to bring in new clients? Yeah, absolutely. The book you use as a tool to open the doors. Um, and so there's an interesting thing that happens when you become a published author. Uh, you get a level of instant credibility that you don't really get with other things, right? Everybody in your industry probably has very similar um, credentials as far as you know, training and education and even experience to a degree. But a book kind of makes you go, you're the expert on this subject. So now you're more likely to get speaking engagements. You're more likely to be invited onto podcasts as the guest expert because you've written the book on that subject and people can kind of check out what your expertise is. So from a business perspective, you wanna write a book that is in line with what your goal is and who your audience is for your business. Um, Cause a lot of people will write a book that's based on their personal story, which is great, but they think it's going to grow their business which is totally a different, you know, in a different realm targeting different people. So you have to look at who's your ideal reader for this book and how is that connecting with that ideal reader going to benefit your business and you have to marry all of that together. And, and I want to reinforce the statement you said earlier about how, deciding on your goal. Because in my experience, a lot of our clients come to us and they'll say, I have a book and I want to use it. And, and part of their goal will be to, to sell 10,000 copies. And part of their goal is to leverage it for new clients. And the challenge in my experience with B2B or professional services is that in that business, you're selling on quality over quantity. If you get three new deals a, a month, for a hundred thousand dollars, you're happy, right? Mm -hmm. But when you're selling books for 1099 or 899 or 399 or whatever it is, you need to sell hundreds of thousands of books. And that marketing strategy is vastly different. And so often I tell my clients it's important you have to pick a primary strategy and a secondary strategy. And one will ultimately fall. Well, if you do the book sales, I feel like the in the very long game the business strategy will follow, but it's a whole different marketing strategy after the fact. And so it's about preparing yourself, I think, for the long game and the short game. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and I do. I, I mean, you, you summarized it beautifully. And I think the piece a lot of people have to think about is before they start writing that piece, because if you're going for book sales, you are targeting probably a slightly different audience than you might be writing if, you, if your mm -hmm. ultimate goal is, hey, I want to get clients from this. Mm -hmm. because you're the person who, you know, if you want to sell thousands of books, your audience is going to be slightly different than I want the people who have a million dollars net worth to come hire me in my services business. So, mm -hmm. um, so there is some of that strategic thinking you do need to think of before, and then you do have to choose because if you try to go for both, you're going to wash out your message and it's not going to be as impactful because you're not a celebrity. A lot of people will go, oh, well, that book's a general book in this subject and it's for a general audience. And you all go, yeah, but that's Malcolm Gladwell. Or that's, you know, that's somebody who everybody knows their name. They've got 15 and million Instagram followers. It's a little it, bit different. <laughs> it's very different. And so you, as an unknown name, wanting to become more known, you have to start with something that's very specific, have a very clear outcome for that audience and just go for it and, and dive straight in. So you do have to have that goal in mind beforehand. So you're targeting them. Um, but it's, it is interesting on the marketing perspective, because the things that often grow your brand, like podcasts, like media, um, you know, speaking engagements, they rarely are directly going to lead to book sales, um, yeah. but they often lead to more great opportunities and clients. So yeah. it's, a, it's, there, there are trade-offs. 
Yeah. And the book sales can it like, for example, you know, if, if I was going to a speaking engagement and they weren't able to pay me, maybe the trade-off would be like, well, then, you know, I'm buy 20 books and we'll do a giveaway or whatever for, for your audience. And, it, and so it sounds like to me, the, the book is not necessarily the product. In many cases, it's the introduction to the product. And then there's something that comes on the back end of that. Let me ask you then when you're putting together and I'm going to use a, a business book of some mm-hmm. sort, which is what most of our audience will be interested in doing, right? At some point, yeah. they may have motivational or personal development books because they're motivational speakers, but for, for all intents and purposes, it's business. And there is like, there's a lot of them out there. <laughs> and we haven't heard of the vast majority of any of them. So how do you make a book compelling? What makes it compelling is it is it the cover is it the con how do you make a compelling book there's the question yeah and it's <laughs> it's it is the question because a lot of people write the book and then they try to figure out how to sell the book and okay. that's why one of the reasons I started the company was to bring marketing to that very first conversation and figure out first of all you have to get clearer on that audience I'm sure this is a conversation you have with clients all the time who is your audience and it's not okay it's females between 40 and 50 because that is not an Their hopes group. and dreams. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. It's, it's getting, and I've been telling people it's the outcome of the outcome. Okay. So now you teach them how to, um, you know, manage their finances, but now it's not that their finances are managed. What's happening after those man, those finances are managed in their life that they care about. Like mm-hmm. what's that thing that they really, really want or that they want to avoid. It can be like a transformation almost. Yes, exactly. And so sometimes it's a numerical, sometimes it's an emotional, sometimes it's a relationship or ego, but you have to get to that piece and you got to know your person so well that you can speak directly to it so that when you are, you know, going for that speaking engagement or that podcast interview or that media, or ultimately the sale of whatever you're selling, the person just goes, Oh yeah, like that's me. And I need that, you know, get, get me that book or get me that person. Um, or my audience needs that. And it, a lot of people go way too general because they think yeah. I want my book to sell millions of copies. So I need it to be for a general audience, but you really, you're like better, you better off. quadruple your marketing budget because right? if you're going general, you've got a lot more competition also. Yeah. It's like Coca-Cola, right? You, yeah. you, you have the budget of Coca-Cola. Cause if you do, then great, go general. <laughs> <laughs> then your market's bigger and you're the, the world's your oyster, but yeah. Exactly. You know, I have a trick for that too. And it's about being niche and knowing, knowing the emotional pain. So in marketing and sales, we have the funnel of surface level pain, financial pain, and emotional pain. Mm -hmm. And whether you're in sales or marketing or whatever you're doing, if you can get somebody down to the emotional pain in the conversation you're having with them, you can, you'll close the deal every time, or you'll, you'll, you'll touch, I was gonna say you'll touch them in a certain way, but I did, that sounds really bad. You'll touch (laughs) their soul. That's a different Let's kind edit of book. that one out. Yeah, <laughs> that's not what I meant. What I meant was you'll you'll resonate with them in a way that is compelling. And so, for example, if you're a business owner, and I say, well, you should do if you do marketing. The, their their of pain is they call me up and they say, Rachel, I need social media marketing. I'm like, all right, well, that's not exactly what they need, but that's what they think they need. That's their surface level pain. Why do they think they need it? I need my company to make more money. Because, and so I know, so I need social media marketing. So now I've dug down to the financial, so how much more money do you need? Well, we're, we're in the red and we need another half a million dollars a year. And then we'll go down even more. Well, what happens if you don't get that? Well, I can't send my kid to college or I have to stop paying for college or I can't pay for my kid's wedding or I'm going to lose my house or I can't pay my hundred employees anymore. And I'm going to have to do layoffs. If you can get from, I needed social media marketing to, I'm going to have to do 50% of my layoff, 50% of my workforce you've resonated with them. And so you need your, uh, my assumption is, Julie, is that you need the book to do the same thing, but that's only by truly understanding that person or that group of people's emotional impact. Exactly, exactly. And it's, and it's one of those things where I always give the example, we had a, a client who wrote a book on tacti- is tactical lock picking. So if you're a first responder and you need to get through a locked obstacle, And, you know, and so that was the book and it was, you know, to save lives and to, to reduce property damage. And there's lots of emotions around that, but it's very specific, right? I mean, other than probably some nefarious purposes of needing to pick locks, the people that are the market for that book are first responders, but we had a 70% success rate in our pitches, right? So when we reached out to people for paid service, paid webinars, paid speaking, 
podcast media, they all said yes, because they were like, this is exactly what my audience needs. So if you can get down to that point where somebody goes, this is exactly what my audience needs, your marketing is going to be great and you will sell books and you will grow your business. Let me ask you, you, oh, oh, sorry. sorry. No, no, no. Go ahead, Rachel. The follow-up question. When I'm doing a mark, when I meet with a client for the first time, the first thing I ask is like, what do we want to achieve? Who are we talking to? And I do a full marketing plan before we start going to market. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you do the same thing before you even write that book. You're figuring out the audience, the message, how we're going to use it, what we're going to do it. And then the the book's almost your messaging strategy, right? Exactly. And wow, it's, Julie, it's, I like you a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I told you we were going to have a lot to talk uh-huh. about. Yeah. So, I mean, that's really what we do. So we have a process that we've built into our writers and our writing coaches that work with our clients and they are extracting the information the marketing team needs. And they're at the same time, they're creating the hook of the book, which is that through line that's going to lead to that outcome of the outcome. And they're designing the book based on that. And it works for memoirs too. Like, so people sitting here going, well, I'm going to be writing a, a, a book about my life. Well, that's totally fine. You still need an outcome of the outcome because you're not a known name. So people are not going to pick up the book because of your name. They're going to pick it up because of the storyline that you're going to take them through to feel that way or change whatever it is that they're experiencing in their life. Um, and so, yeah, our team does that. And then it feeds into our book marketing team. They review it. They talk to the writing team and it's, it's a back and forth. Because at the end of the day, my team's going to be marketing you at the end. So the more we set it up for success from the beginning, the, the happier everybody on my team is and the happier our clients are. <laughs> and, and, and that makes perfect sense. Let me ask you, I think one of the things that, that oh, I want to write a book, I, I don't have the time, I, I don't have the time, I don't know how to do it. Like, what are some writing, I guess, tips maybe is the right word to ask? You know, is it like if you really block yourself off for an entire week. Once you have the blueprint and you just write 10 hours a day, you can knock a book out. And here's, here's some tips for writing. I mean, what, what are the, how do you get started and some good writing tips? Yeah. I mean, first everybody's different. So there's not like how I write is different than like every one of my clients does it differently. Some people do voice notes and they like get it transcribed and then edited. So there's, there is a way, like, it doesn't matter who you are. There's a way to get a book written, but there's two things that I highly recommend. One is you get that clarity of the message that you're writing and who you're writing for, because it could be so much easier. If you're struggling to write, you're lacking clarity or you're lacking content. It's almost always one of those two things. Sometimes it can be confidence. So we just made up three C's. You're lacking clarity, confidence, or, <laughs> or content. I get one more in there. The one <laughs> exactly. So it's one of those three things. So the more you've got clarity, um, you'll feel more confident. And if you're missing content, well, maybe you need to do research or talk to more people. But that will give you something to always write whenever you do have a minute. But my favorite thing is to not read what you've written. So if you're writing this book yourself, you're not working with a ghostwriter, just leave yourself a prompt when you finish for the day. And rather than going back and rereading your chapter so that you end up with the most polished first chapter and nothing else, uh, you just leave a prompt and sit down and write. And don't let yourself go back and reread until all of the content is out of your head and on the page. And if you do that, you can make a lot of, you can make a lot of progress without having a lot of time. Um, and then the other thing I always recommend, I'm giving you a third one, is a writing sprint, which is a 12 minute, you do nothing but type and you just imagine Pac-Man is coming for you. And so this is your chance to a common story that you tell over and over or a three-step process or that acronym that you use, get like, just dump it out of your brain in that 12 minute sprint. And you don't stop typing. If you're running out of things to say, you say, I don't know what to say. And then you just, your fingers just go and it trains you to write faster. That's so smart. Let me ask you one other question. Well, I probably will have a bunch, but I'm going to limit it to one for now. How do you do the whole Amazon number one bestseller thing? Like, how does that happen? How do you become a number one bestseller? Is it strictly based on the book? Are there ways to help the system work, you know, to your benefit or on your behalf? How does that happen? Yeah, there's gimmicks, there's games you can play uh, and you can definitely rig it so that it's, I mean, and truthfully, if you're going in a category, um, if you choose the right category, you probably only need to sell 20 books in a day in order to get that number one flag. Some categories, it might be 45 books in a day, but it's often a letdown for people when they get the flag. They're like, how amazing, how many books did I sell? And we look it up and we're like, (laughs) 22. <laughs> so it's, it's not something we focus on as a company. I mean, having, having gone to number one overall, it was thousands of book sales, you know, in a period of time. Sure. 
but it, it's one of those things where like, I don't, I can't repeat that. That was a lot of people that just happened to rally behind me in a given week that there wasn't a Harry Potter book out. There wasn't a, like, you know, I had to, there was some luck in that, right? I wasn't competing with somebody selling 20,000 books that week, but Amazon updates every hour and it has diminishing value over the day in what those sales are worth. And over the week they're worth less. Um, so they're worth the most in that hour after that they've sold. Um, so you can game the system. There's companies that will happily take $5,000 from you to give you a bestseller tag. Um, but I always caution people against gaming the system because what happens, especially on Amazon, it's an algorithm machine and you teach it who is your buyer and then they will show your book to more people who are your buyers. When you game the system, you're almost always gaming it with a group of people who aren't your ideal buyer. And I've seen this with a real estate book, a friend of mine did, um, and his book was being shown to law of attraction, relationship books, cookbooks, and others for a year after his book came out because of this Amazon bestseller gimmick going to all the people. So I wouldn't mess with the Amazon algorithm, focus on your ideal reader, focus on getting that book out there and, and your ultimate goal. And you'll probably get that flag anyways. Yeah. I love that. So let me switch over now to marketing your business and you touched upon this, but how do you leverage the book? to increase your expert, your, your thought leadership, your expertise in the industry, um, your brand, and to get new clients. Yeah. So don't focus on selling the book, use the book to open the door and then drive people back to your website or to even better to a landing page mm -hmm. to sign up for your newsletter. So you could build a long-term relationship with those folks. Um, it, it's a much stronger approach than trying to drive sales to a book. Give them a reason to go to your website, grab something, now you can start emailing them and your next email to them can be, Hey, by the way, I have a book, <laughs> get, go get this book. Can you um, say, give them something? Do you mean like an expert excerpt? Oh my God, Carrie, help me excerpt from the book excerpt. or get, you know, yeah. what are we giving them? It could be. Um, I generally don't do that though. I generally say, give them something that's like, and I mean, you guys are marketers, so you probably give great advice on this, but a checklist, a, you know, like a, an easy win, like a worksheet. Here's exactly. something that helps you keep track of where you're going. And, and by the way, you can use it as you're looking at my online course and they all work together and you're something. Okay. Exactly. Like when we're done and you say, Hey, Julie, where can people learn more? I'm going to say, go to booklaunchers.com forward slash business book. And it's a workbook that will allow you to walk through figuring out who your audience is, your hook, and how to create an outline for your book so that your business book is set up to sell. It, it's a win. You don't need me after that, but after you see how cool your book's going to be, you might want to contact me and say, how can I work with book launchers? <laughs> I'm gonna and ask that's you, what you want. <laughs> I'm going to ask you questions. So yeah. I, I always wonder this. So one of the challenges, I'm all about hooks and, and getting them in the funnel and, and providing more and more information and greater and greater value. One of the challenges I have with clients that have books is they all want to sell it on Amazon, right? But as marketers, it like hurts my soul because I can't get any data from Amazon once you buy oh, the book. I'm so excited. Oh my God. <laughs> tell me, so, tell me. So me, I run, I run ads, right? And I'm the same way. I'm like, I don't know what ads are doing anything. So I have a page that's set up through a service called Lulu. Mm -hmm. Shopify is partnered with Lulu. And I drive, say any ad that I run, I drive sales to this Lulu page where I sell my book. It feeds into my CRM and they now are getting, I get their mailing address, their email address, and they've bought my book and they get a download. You no know sales on Amazon at all? No, I do. Um, but any ads that I'm paying for, okay. I'm driving to this page. Yeah. So I get the data. I mean, at Got the it. end of the day, I want my book to be anywhere somebody's looking for it. So it's going to sure. be on Amazon. It's going to be on Barnes and Noble. Mm -hmm. But from an advertising perspective, I want that data. And if I've yeah. paid for that click, I want to know who you are. <laughs> okay. So, so that's what I do. And there's, and so there's lots of ways. I thought you had a way to figure out the data from Amazon. I got so excited, but no. that's still a good suggestion. But, <laughs> I'll take but there's it. other ways to do it. And I mean, yes. we, ha we have clients who will not sell on Amazon. And so there mm -hmm. are, you know, there's certain people that are just like, there will be no Amazon for my book. Um, and so they actually open up the doors for them to have better data. And they, mm -hmm. they also give away a lot of books. Uh, for free. So then you're sacrificing that quantity game that we talked about, exactly. right? It's the, it's the tricky. It's the trade-off. Yeah. Trade-off. Can I ask, can I ask sort of a tactical question? And mm -hmm. I'm going to switch back to the writing thing um, from the marketing. And that is, is there a way to repurpose content that you already have out there and turn it into a book? Like, I don't know, let's say you have a 
a great blog or I don't know, I'm making things up off the top of my head. Is there a way to repurpose so that the creation doesn't seem as overwhelming that you suggest people look at or consider? Um, yeah. So, I mean, what, what I do personally is I, I shoot a lot of YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. I create the outline for my book and then I take the transcripts of the videos and put them into the book. And then I go back and I backfill. And then usually what I do is I actually shoot a video to create the script and then take that for the gaps. But sometimes I just have to write. <laughs> so, so you take a video and you, you take the transcript, you put it in, and then you add extra context or whatever where necessary. Yeah. And, and smooth it out. And yeah. so for some of our clients, though, our writers do that. So they'll give us the content and then the writer actually fills in the gaps and smooths it out and takes out the things that aren't applicable and then asks for more stories. It's usually the content that you've written in other, con in other contexts usually lacks the story that you need to bring into a book mm -hmm. to make it interesting and engaging. So that's the piece that has to go. But um, I, for me, that's been a really fast way to get content down, you know, to can get through 10,000 words in, in a week really fast with pulling scripts and shooting videos. Very cool. So Julie, we're, we're coming up on time. Where can our uh, audience find more information about you? Is there a workbook maybe? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so glad you asked. They can go to booklaunchers.com forward slash business book and download a guide that will help you set yourself up to write a book that will be uh, used to grow your business and build your brand. Julie, you were amazing. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you so much. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this out there and you don't have to answer it if you want to, but we do usually ask our guests. I and, just messaged Carrie that I didn't prep you for this. So I feel bad <laughs> asking it. But I'll, so don't sweat it. If you can't answer, we'll edit it out uh, as, as, as we will much of the beginning of this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Care to share the weirdest thing that's ever happened to you? And we've had guests share a whole host of weird stuff. So if there's anything that pops into your mind that would give our audience a good sort of hashtag behind the scenes look at Julie Broad, <laughs> we'd love to share it. The weirdest thing. I don't know. I, that's a good question. I don't even know if I'd have a good answer if you prepped me for it. Um, I mean, to me, the, the weirdest thing is when somebody recognizes me that I don't know, and they come up to me and they go, they start talking to me like I should know them. And then I'm thinking, well, where have I met them? And I pretend I go along with it. <laughs> I, you know, the trick for that is I'll say to my husband, this is my husband, so is, or my friend Carrie, and, yeah. and I won't introduce the other person. <laughs> yeah, force them to say the name. Yeah. And they realize what, what, that this, I met this person like a year ago at a cocktail party, and that's why I don't remember them. Or, or the, like, you don't, you've never met them. That's you've the, never the met them. Yeah, yes. You've never met them. So yeah, you've that's, that's the know. weirdest thing I can think of. <laughs> so Carrie, okay. this reminds me, if you want to have a weirdest thing comment. Um, so we had a guest once who was a VH1 actress and she told us about a story where like a guy would ask her for pictures of her feet and she was like a poor actress and like he would pay like 750 bucks for it. And so she would just like send him these pictures of her feet. And she's like, every time I needed money, I was like, hey, do you need more? Feet pick. Anyway, I remember that story. That was like, God, six months ago, right, Carrie, that we yeah. heard that. So I'm I'm on I'm on a trip with my husband for his work. And it's like a sales, you know, incentives trip. And I hear a story that apparently I won't say what company it is. In their office, there's a thing going around where girls are selling pictures of their feet, like on a network. Oh my <laughs> god. Like three or four hundred dollars a pop. So apparently this is a big thing. And if yeah. you guys want in, I know people now. <laughs> <laughs> like I that, want to know the website, right? Are you going to go buy a picture of a foot? I know where I can sell my own. I'm more interested in the three or four hundred dollars for. We'll see. I don't know. Oh anyway, anyway, I digress. So, Carrie, on that total disaster, you should wrap up. <laughs> the human beast is a strange animal. <sighs> Julie, it was wonderful to have you on this episode of the Mavens of Marketing. To our audience, we always appreciate you, and we'll see you back here next week, same time and same place.